Oh, hello. I'm Richard Nafshin from Oregon State University, and this is a uh, lecture hall here in Gilbert Hall where we do quite a bit of chemistry. It's a four-story building, has a basement and goes up to three, and uh, really enjoy this building. It's got some chalkboards, has some periodic tables. We do some demonstrations on the countertop and uh, teach and learn some chemistry. The uh, periodic table up here used to not have this red staircase. One night I came in with some red tape and separated these over on the left, which are the metals, from these over on the right, which are the non-metals. These right here on the border are often called semi-metals or metalloids because they can behave like metals or non-metals depending on what their environment is. The metals, they're not very fond of electrons and like to lose electrons. In particular, the group ones like to lose one and become plus one. The group twos like to lose two electrons and become two plus. We will not talk too much about the charge that the transition metals, these 10 groups in the middle, like to take on. We can discuss if we're told what the charge is or what its environment is, but it's not fair to say these are 3 plus, these are 4 plus, these are 5 plus, 6 plus, 7 plus. They're transitional and they often change. Over here, these are the noble gases. The old term was inert gas, but we have since reacted some of them. Niels Bartlett at Cal first in the early 60s reacted xenon with some platinum and fluorine. But these don't take on a charge traditionally. They don't do a lot of chemistry, particularly for general chemistry students. So we say they're inert, relatively unreactive, and don't have a charge. These over here, often called the halogens, will go ahead and gain one electron. The non-metals to the right of the staircase, but not including these gases, will go ahead and gain electrons. These will gain one and become minus one gain two and become minus two, gain three and become minus three. We can talk about carbon actually gaining four electrons. There's precedent, there's example for this, and becoming minus four. And boron is just small. People like to call it an exception, but it does its own chemistry. And so don't, don't, don't anticipate minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five. Boron will quite often go minus three. We do a little bit of boron chemistry. There's also one element I have to mention, that sneaky aluminum. As I said before, these go plus one, plus two. Let's make a huge jump over the transition metals, and aluminum sneaks in at plus three. When we're making ionic compounds, this gives us a chance to do the chemical combinations, such as calcium will lose two electrons and become calcium two plus. So when it bonds, forming an ionic compound with, say, fluoride, We cannot have the chemical formula of CaF. The charges don't wash. The charges don't cancel. Two plus minus one don't happen to wash out. So what we have to do is add another fluoride. And now our plus two charge is offset by minus and minus. Chemical formula is written as CaF2. We can do this exercise also with some polyatomic ions, such as sulfate. Sulfate has the formula SO4 2 minus. It behaves as though somebody was thinking about it being a non-metal with a negative charge. But we're not allowed to bust up the sulfur from the oxygens. The whole piece stays together. Chemical combination for, say, sodium sulfate would look something like this. A sulfate polyatomic ion has a negative 2 charge. When we combine this with sodium, to make an ionic compound, sodium being in group number one would be plus one. Washing the charges, not quite. We need another sodium. And now we get the cancellation of two positive charges with the two negative. Our chemical formula is Na2SO4.